We often think of philosophy as this stuffy and useless academic subject. It's just a relic of the past. But what if I told you that philosophy might be the most important component of personal and professional growth in the 21st century? I wouldn't believe it either. A few years ago, I started a company called Strategy of Mind. It's a leadership development and organizational performance organization. But a few fun facts about myself. I have never been an executive coach. I have never been an executive. I have no leadership experience. I do not have an MBA. And I have no technical skills really at all. So why am I here? <laughs> and what does a kid with no skills do after he graduates from university? He becomes a consultant and tells other people what to do. And that's what I did. I became a consultant. And one day, I was sitting at my desk as a consultant in what wasn't the happiest of jobs when a friend sent me an article in The Economist called Philosopher Kings. And the article said that business leaders would benefit from studying great writers. I've always loved great writers. In fact, when I was in school, I thought that I was one. I'm not. But the article reminded me of a picture that I had taken several years back as a student. See, I love bookstores, and that's probably why I love great writers. And on one of my many frequent visits to our local bookshop, I noticed this sign that they posted during a period of renovation. The sign said, mathematics ends, philosophy begins. I tell people that it really was at that moment, sitting at my desk as a consultant, reading the article Philosopher Kings, looking at this picture, Mathematics Ends, Philosophy Begins, that I first had the idea to launch a philosophy company. I studied philosophy in school. I studied philosophy in graduate school, and now you know why I have no skills. It reminds me of a joke one of my professors told us after class. How do you get the philosophy major off of your doorstep? You pay for the pizza. But in reality, I felt as though I had developed a fairly comprehensive set of skills. And what I witnessed sitting there at my desk, thinking mathematics ends, philosophy begins, is that there's a disconnect. There's a skills gap between the professional world and the philosophical world that I was a part of. So we think of philosophy in a professional setting. What does mathematics ends, philosophy begins? I'm a manager, and I'm looking at my third quarter numbers, and I'd like to be successful in the third quarter of next year. Chances are that I, I have to ask myself questions that extend beyond mathematics. Questions like, how can we think more strategically about the challenges we face? How can we communicate better with our customers and our clients? How can we create new products and services? I had the idea that in order for a business to be successful in the 21st century and beyond, it really had to apply the concepts that I had developed throughout the course of my philosophical training, like the ability to think strategically, like the ability to communicate, like the ability to be creative. And also, philosophy is more than just that manager asking questions. When I was a consultant, I was paid a lot of money to tell people what to do. But I understand that we've only been together for a few minutes, and I hope in the few minutes thus far you've learned that I, in fact, know nothing. So I should not be telling anyone what to do. But philosophy was a method. It's a mechanism for change. People don't like being told what to do or how they should think. Chances are your parents tell you how to, do, how to act and how to think, and it probably drives you crazy, just like it drives me crazy when my parents do it. But the most effective method of learning is learning through your own collective experience. And philosophy affords that opportunity. Socrates didn't engage others in dialogue just to tell them how they should act or to tell them how they should think. He asked open-ended questions, questions that were, didn't have binary yes or no answers to encourage them to think on their own. And that's a very helpful lesson in business. I started thinking that as a consultant, maybe my role wasn't to tell this manager what to do. Maybe that I should apply the skills of philosophy to help them reach intelligent conclusions. So I started the philosophy company a couple of years ago. And what happened? I saw a lot of the faces that I see now in the room. People were skeptical of this. People were unsure of this. I got one message from somebody that said, a philosophy company is an oxymoron started by a moron. And that was from my mother. But in reality, it's difficult. I sent over 4,000 personal emails, not using HubSpot, not using Salesforce, no, not using any CRM. I sent 4,000 personal emails before we had our first paying client. So for those of you in the room who are interested in starting a philosophy company, don't. <laughs> I became my own first client. Here I was telling these organizations that they had to be more philosophical, that they had to apply the skills of philosophy in order to be successful and nobody was buying it. So I was the test case. And it was a very helpful lesson for us as a new business. 
because we had to think more strategically about the challenges we were facing. We had to communicate with one another, and we had to innovate products and services. One of the most common questions that I'm asked now is, what book got you interested in philosophy in the first place? What book started it all? And my mature response is generally Plato's Republic. It was the first book that I read as an undergraduate in my very first undergraduate seminar as a philosophy student in university. I remember the professor said to go home, read book one, and highlight what you think was important. And I came back with what looked like a coloring book. <laughs> That's actually my book. But speaking of coloring book, I first fell in love with philosophy as a child, reading children's books. My favorite author growing up was a guy named Chris Van Allsburg. He wrote books like The Polar Express and Jumanji. He actually wrote a lot of books. And the best way I can describe him for people who are unfamiliar is that he's kind of like a Borges for children. And philosophy begins in wonder. And children wonder about a lot of things. Really, really good children's books help kids better understand and better conceptualize the world around them. Kids ask really good questions. And as adults, we sometimes unlearn how to ask the good questions. When businesses ask good questions, they thrive and they grow. When they don't, they stagnate. What I'm trying to say is that you don't need to read Heidegger's Being in Time to engage with philosophy. You can save being in time for later. That's a philosophy joke for those of you in the room. <laughs> philosophy has become isolated from society. We've become alienated from the subject. And that isolation and alienation is, is directly contributing to the subject's demise. It's led to missed opportunities for business, and it's led to missed opportunities for us as a society. I don't think I need to take a straw poll in the room, but there are times in our global community that we have an inability to think strategically. We have an inability to communicate with one another, or we have an inability to be creative. I remember reading Chris Van Allsburg as a kid and thinking things. And, you know, granted my limited vocabulary, which is still somewhat limited, prevented me from articulating that activity as philosophy. But that's what I was doing. Philosophy is something that begins in wonder. And it's not something that you have to rely upon an expertise or a PhD in order to be successful in the subject. So I'd like to leave you with three things that you can do today, you can do tonight, you can do tomorrow to reintroduce philosophy into your life. Number one, think. Don't think what your friends tell you. Don't think what you read online. Don't think what your family tells you. Just think. Definitely don't think what your spouse tells you. Think independently and isolated. Number two, talk. If after thinking, you feel that you have an idea that's worth discussing with somebody else, share it with somebody. It can be a friend, it can be a family member, it can be a colleague, it can be a stranger. It doesn't make a difference. But just have a conversation, engage somebody in dialogue. And lastly, number three, create. If after thinking and after talking, you feel there's an idea that's worth bringing to the world, write it down. It can be a sentence, it can be a paragraph, it can be a book, it can be a film, it can be a TED Talk. And I realize that these steps of think, talk, create aren't necessarily, they seem simple, but they're not. It's actually a unique component of philosophy that very little is required to engage in the subject, but the act of doing so is far more complicated. And I told you that I started a leadership development and organizational growth company where we focus on executive coaching and sort of leadership development, but all we're really doing is bringing philosophy into these organizations. I realize it's probably not the smartest thing to stand up here and to tell you our recipe for success, but the reason why we call ourselves a company that focuses on organizational growth is because that's what the business world responds to. But our method, our approach, it's philosophy. We help companies think critically, communicate effectively, and create new ideas. That's all philosophy is. It's those three things. Think, talk, create is the model of the republic. They think about, they talk about, and they create an ideal republic. Think, talk, create is the model of TED. TED is philosophy. And Think, Talk, Create was very helpful to David and I in starting our business. It forced us to stop spinning our wheels. We had to think strategically about the challenges we were facing. We had to communicate our concerns with one another. And we had to innovate the product and services we offer today. 
Think Talk Create extends beyond business. It matters to us as a society. We need to think more strategically and critically. We need to communicate better with one another. And we need to innovate creative solutions to the problems that we're facing today as a global community. So the next time you're walking through your local bookshop and you happen to pass the philosophy section, perhaps where mathematics ends, don't walk past it. Maybe it's even the children's book section. It sounds silly, but the oldest subject in the world, however many thousands of years ago, we first looked up at the stars and thought, hmm, I wonder what that is. The oldest subject in the world might be the most important subject for our future. Thank you.